Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith, and today we are lucky to have with us composer Matt Bowen. Matt Bowen is an ASCAP award-winning composer based in Los Angeles. A classically trained violinist from the age of three and later a member of a touring youth symphony, he ultimately shifted to working behind the scenes. He teamed up with record producer Matt Wallace, working as an engineer on RIAA certified platinum singles, Michael Franti and Spearhead's All Rebel Rebel Rockers and OAR's All Sides. As composing projects continued to ramp up, he ultimately pivoted to composing full time. In addition to composing, Matt has contributed as an arranger, orchestrator, and composer of additional music on a wide variety of projects for all mediums. He frequently works on Christopher Leonard's music team on projects such as The Boys and Bad Moms. His most recent work as co-composer can be heard on Amazon Prime's video series Gen V. So Matt Bowen, thank you so much for being here and chatting with me, and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Christine. It's uh, great to be here. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you. I love the music for Gen V and I'm it's so different and creative and I can't wait to just kind of pick it apart and figure out how it is that you created all of that. Um, but I will say this, it is very different from the music that a little three-year-old plays in classical <laughs> violin. So, <laughs> oh, yes, so it is. How do you get from Twinkle Twinkle all the way to Gen V? Um, wow, that is, uh, I love the framing of, of that, starting with uh, <laughs> Twinkle Twinkle, which, yes, you, yes, as, as you well know, that is song number one. Um, well, um, you know, Gen V ha- does have quite a bit of weird exper- experimental violin in it, I have to say. So it's not that I ever <laughs> pivoted. Uh, it's not that I ever pivoted away from it. It's more that I've just kind of, I guess, added to my experiences along the way. Yeah. So so violin started at three. I, I asked for it. Um, I was not in a musical family. Um and, you know, I, there was just something about it that I was fascinated with. And I think that's the inherent interest is kind of what helps a, a three and then on year old stick to something like that and stick to it willingly. Um, and then there's also an, a, a, an ignorance is bliss to it that, you know, if you pick up a violin for the first time when you're in high school, I mean, it's a horrendous instrument to learn, you know, that, that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. When did you? You're you're uh, quite the pianist. I don't know when you started on that. Yeah, I started um, formal at six, but I actually tried taking violin lessons as an adult, and I lasted three months. And my body just doesn't bend that way. It, it just well, doesn't and it's, do it. it. It's also uh, yeah. The other mistake you probably had is that you you had a good ear. And you're using your good ear to listen to this probably not great sound. It's it's a you know it's it's a it, and so you're like I I'm out. Um, yeah, I mean it's tough. It's well you 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 can walk up to a piano and just hit a key and there's immediately a nice tone, right? right? Like I'm not I don't mean to oversimplify it, but you can have like a rewarding experience sonically, like on the first day, pretty, yeah, on mm-hmm. the first day. Um, and and the violin is not that um so by the time <laughs> i kind of i think had some sensibilities about the violin i was at least uh i was far enough along where i was at least making a nice tone okay. um so um yeah that that's those were the beginning days and uh, yeah and i and i never i never stopped and it was all very very violin focused all the way up through high school um as I would kind of pivot in, is if I was looking for other experiences, it was through orchestras. Um, and I ultimately in, uh, joined the San Diego youth symphony. And that was an, an just an incredible, uh, an experience. Um, we got to travel. We, we went on a tour around like Spain and stuff. And so, yeah, it was, it was all violin all the time, all the way kind of up through into college. And that's when I started, uh, dabbling with, you know, to, would join a band. And I started with playing the violin in bands. You know, violin is a melody only right. instrument. And I just really didn't have a concept of, um, I, mean, I think I was kind of taught the basics about 
harmon- harmony and harmonic structure, but it doesn't really process. You know, when you're playing the piano, you you can you it's you can see it. It's just it's yeah. literally a graph of uh, it's laid out, and so that that's I, I guess I'm just I'm, I'm harping on that because my mind started to blow a little bit about how little I actually knew when the band okay. members were talking about chord progressions, and I was like, oh my gosh. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of a wake it, up call. Yeah. It, uh, and um, it, it was really cool first, you know, to have, to have kind of gone that long and not really thought about harmonic structure. Um, and I, so I would play all my parts by ear, not really considering what the chords were or even what key we were in. Um and I remember the bassist was always, he was just a, he was a music theory just to the nine. And he would always be like, man, how, what, how would you think of that part? I mean, there's like an inverted ninth or whatever. And like, I, I don't know these words that you're saying to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, but that was kind of the gateway to, you know, learning about you know, song structure and chords and harmonic structure. And then, and then the gateway to also trying new instruments because, you know, maybe the song would be better if I could do something on guitar while the other guitarist does something else. And so, um, I entered a whole new phase of all I know is that I don't know nothing. And it was, but it was kind of awesome. So, so when you were playing the guitar, did you start like playing around with chords or were you just kind of soloing on it? No, it was, that was chords for sure. That was, um, okay. I remember the very first time I played uh, like a like a very traditional pop, like a six four one five chord progression. But but I didn't know that that was like the quintessential chord progression, or whatever. I remember, like I played it, and I remember thinking, like, oh my god, I just came up with the <laughs> most iconic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's there's kind of a beauty to figuring it out yourself, rather than someone being like, hey, this is what all pop songs are. I remember, yeah. like, I just was like, I would just play it over and over again. It's like, God, this thing that I came up with, but, but, uh, and then, yeah, and then you, and, and then you slowly start to learn that, oh, this is, this is what everyone's um, using. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did. But I re- thinking, I'm a genius. <laughs> I did. I did think for a moment. Um, I, I reinvented the wheel and then took that wheel out to the world and tried to show it to a wheel shop. <laughs> basically. <laughs> so, okay. So, so then, so you've got this wonderful chord progression. How does this go to all of a sudden you're a composer? I don't, this is like, yeah, incredible. I guess that's, that's a bigger jump. Um, um, there's, there's a big period in between, which was at, uh, after kind of my most significant band broke up, I, I took all our little chunk of change from that and invested in a, in a modest home recording setup. And that's when I realized how much I loved the, we had, we had made three albums. So I had been in a studio and I had been fascinated by it, but there wasn't enough time to be like, Oh, you know, what's that? Or can you show me that? It's like, no, that's not what we're doing here. We're making an album. Um, so I started tinkering behind uh, on my own. And um, again, that was like, a, Oh my gosh, I know nothing sort of moment, but in the best way possible. Spent a couple of years uh, on that and started taking some online courses um, through Berkeley School of Music. I was already married, and my wife was like, "You spend a lot of time doing that. What if you could do that during the day, <laughs> and then we could <laughs> hang out?" Um, um, uh, I was like, "Yeah, no." That, uh, and then there's also a. I mean, I don't mean to to do it so cavalierly. There was also a tinge of she she had some some faith in. Um, in my ability to potentially make that leap, um, we moved to LA and in hindsight, it was for no good reason. I did not have like that thing to move for, um, but we did. And if it felt a little less crazy, maybe in a weird way, already having been married, but I I don't need to get into the psychology of it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, it, and I had started a I had started an email relationship with that producer you mentioned in the intro, Matt Wallace, um, mm-hmm. and that was a little. I was like, you know, if I can get a hold of this person and have a productive conversation, just that alone made it all feel all the more doable to move to LA. 
Um, so did you just like kind of cold call? Sort I of email? totally cold emailed him. Now, mind you, I'm going to totally date myself. This is in 2004. Okay. And the ability to like find just somebody's email is, was very like, I, I had found one interview that he had done where I, they had included his email at the bottom. I don't think they probably were supposed to. Wow. Um, and uh, I, but I was, I was, I was a huge fan of his work. Um, I would like to work for this person. And so I emailed him. Um, wow. Yeah. Just, just, uh, it, it's kind of like, I did a bunch of stuff where if I, if I knew everything I knew now back then, I'd be like, don't bother. <laughs> so there, <laughs> there was a lot of ignorance is bliss there going on. Um, but also, I guess, you know, moral stories, what's the worst that could happen is right. you, you don't hear back. But so he, he emailed back and we kind of, we kind of immediately had a few things in common. I was living in the Bay area. He was, he was, uh, he went to Berkeley. My wife went to Berkeley. He's, he, um, this is the, the, the Cal Berkeley, the, the West coast. I, I right, guess I need right. to clarify, clarify in the yeah, musician no, world. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had a we had an email relationship, and uh, I did end up working for him quite a bit. Um, but um, it made it more sane to make the move. Okay, we had already decided to move, but I didn't have anything set up. So I said, "Well, we should have I should have something set up." Um, and so I looked up internships, and um, there was an internship at a music house in Santa Monica called Emoto Music, and so they did music for commercials and stuff, and my interest in them was that they had an in-house studio and they had an in-house engineer. And so my interest in going there was I could kind of shadow the, their in-house engineer and learn as much, even though I, I, I kind of wanted to be a music producer, work on albums. I knew, I knew that learning how to be a good engineer would be an important part of that. There was just one engineer and I could just kind of shadow him and, you know, help him fold cables or, or whatever. Um, now mind you, I was also, my primary job was stocking the fridge and making coffee. Um, but of course, indeed, I knew yeah. that, I, I knew <laughs> that that was kind of, uh, happening there. And, and he s- let you touch his cables, huh? He did not for like a <laughs> month. Right. Cause you got to They, yeah. Oh yeah. Do that, right? Oh no, no, no. Yeah. If he did, if he immediately let me touch his cables, then yes, he was a bad engineer. Right. Because <laughs> yeah. you got to know how to do that properly. Yeah. No, he was. He, so there was one time there was just a gigantic, I think it was a string session. And so there were just cables everywhere. And I, I of course, would never offer to help set up because that's a meticulous process. Breaking down is a little less meti- meticulous. And I remember that was my end. I was like, hey, man, can I can I help clean up? Can I help? He's like, do you know how? <laughs> do you know yeah. how to? You know, you have to do the quarter turn with the cable every other turn. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, no, oh, yeah. I, I've been, I've been through that. Yes. <laughs> oh yes, yes. So you know, it's it's got to. I mean, you don't just put it in a circle. You have they have to. Um, but so he begrudgingly taught me that, and I think he saw that I was open to learning anything. Um, and and so yeah, then he was okay with, and then after that point, he was okay with me breaking down sessions while he could start mixing, which. He loved. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, very good. And then once he saw that I was not um, an idiot, um, he did let me start patching. I could. He would kind of like sketch out what what needed to be on the patch bay for a certain session, and I would patch it all in. So like if you you set up a drum set, it's like okay, well there's nine mics, and I need this to go to that compressor. I need this to go to that EQ, and then compressor, and then, and that all happens on the patch bay. And so I, you know, by the time that I was done with that internship, I did learn. It's like some very rudimentary basics, but this is an incredibly long answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> the, this is that music house had in-house composers. And that was the very first time that I saw what composing looked like in a somewhat modern uh, version of it. And I just say that because um, up until that point, I, I just, I didn't know. I knew John Williams existed. I know he wrote, I, I hear this magical music, but did, you know, did he scratch it out on a piece of paper, which I think he did actually, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, and then, and then how, I just didn't understand the process and I couldn't really wrap my head around what that meant. But what I saw in the music house was that 
composers for the most part, unless you're working on those like super high level A-list movies. Um, and even then that's kind of what they need to do now. The composers for the most part are, are music producers in addition to being composers. So from that point on, I kind of had my eyes on uh, composing as my, as my hopeful path. Um, now, obviously that doesn't, you know, just snap your fingers and say, I'm a composer now. <laughs> right. um, so, and, and I hadn't gone to, I hadn't gone to music school and because I grew up on violin, as we already talked about, I, I didn't have much of a, of a concept of, of harmonic structure. And as a matter of fact, I, um, one of their in-house composers is still a very close friend of mine. And we still joke about the fact that um, there was one time we were all sitting around kind of the main island in the, in the lobby. Um, and, and I was, you know, I was of the frame of mind, like, Hey, I'm going to take any chance I can to ask, a, you know, it, when, it, when appropriate, not annoying, but when appropriate, ask a question, Hey, how did you do this? Or, you know, how did you, mm -hmm. whatever. And, and everyone was very happy to talk about that stuff. Um, and so I remember one time they were, they made a joke about the circle of fifths mm -hmm. and I did not know what the circle of fifths was. And I oh. said, I was like, oh, this seems like a good thing. It's like, oh yeah, cool. So what is the circle of fifths? And there was like <laughs> no. a rec, there was like a record scratch. I know you, you, you're more embarrassed than me right now. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a record scratch. Everyone like what did he like i i guess if if you're a listener and you and you don't know if you were to go to a music theory class if you were to take a music theory class which most composers have at some point like literally day one is here's the circle of fifths right i mean if, right. is that is that a reasonable uh, reduction of of it yeah yeah well and um, if, if you're a piano student you learn the circle of fifths pretty early on right so. Right. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, so this, this, this guy who, you know, he, he's now a very close friend because this is the type of person he was like, so yeah. And he kind of grabs, he grabs a little sheet of paper and he starts kind of marking it out. But I, my heart was sinking because I could realize it was like, oh, I just, I just asked. Yeah. Um, but so that's where I was uh, <laughs> in my music theory uh journey but at that's that so point. great that you asked though because then you got the answer instead of just pretending that you knew what you were doing and <laughs> yeah just i think you would have looked like a complete yeah. idiot had you not asked well yeah well thank you for that um i think i yeah i think i still look like an idiot but um <laughs> no yeah I, no <laughs> that actually prompted me to go start taking some classes at uh, ucla extension um, which they have oh, okay. a phenomenal composer certificate program. Yeah. Well, I think something that you do really well, I was at, as I was listening to the Gen V music, is that I think you are this, well, it's obvious you know what the circle of fifths is now, obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, love, I love the production that you have in this music. It is so cool because you can hear, you can hear the violin, you can hear that classical, you can hear all of that in there. But there's just like this grit to it. And I know there's some distortion, some warping that you do. Can we kind of get into that a little bit about yeah. what techniques you do? Because it's so cool and I love it. And it's so like, I know it's supposed to be, you know, rough and gritty, but it's kind of, to my ears, it's kind of refreshing to hear something different like that. So can you kind of go into what you did? I, I would love to. Um, um, and I guess just to back up just a quick second it, of, oh, sure. uh, uh, no, no, but it's relative to your, to your question, but, um, you know, it is very production heavy and I would just like to kind of harken back to that path that I just described, which is I, I learned engineering first and then I learned writing second. And I, I kind of wouldn't trade that for the world because, um, you know, there's so many, you know, if you learn writing first and you have, you know, you might have all these just wonderful ideas, brilliant ideas, but if you can't document them right. for somebody to listen to, um, then, then you're host. I mean, there's nothing there. Yeah. So and it, I think it, you also kind of 
you also can kind of get stuck in a box of like, okay, right. this is what this can do. And then sometimes you don't like think to think outside of that box at the same time. Uh, totally. So, yes. Yeah, so I, I think um, a lot of my, I learned engineering, you know, the engineering and recording side first, and then writing does come out in the Gen V score. Also, before we get into two specifics too much, which believe you me, I would love nothing more than to geek out. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of that grittiness that you're talking about is coming, is kind of being dictated by a sound that we established on The Boys. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I need to say that. And then because I also need to say that The Boys um, is uh, Chris Leonard's project. And I was on his music team from day one. And I kind of became a very... Um, you know, prominent part of that team to the point where I, I did co-score two episodes from the most recent season, um, season three. So, um, so I guess I'm just bringing all that up because a lot of that grittiness that you're hearing had been established in that, um, in that world already. And that was our, that was our biggest challenge with Gen V was threading the needle, threading the, um, the spinoff needle. Mm -hmm. You know, um, hey, this is a new show. It needs to have a new sound, but it needs to live in the same world. Right. Um, so we did try a lot of new. We we threw a we threw a lot up against the wall. We did some stuff that we would never do on on the boys. Um, like we start we 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 brought in a female vocalist, um, an artist right. goes an artist goes by the name of Katomi, and started you know recording her but also really processing her voice but using a vocalist at all is not really something we'd ever do on boys so that might not sound crazy but it is a that is a shift away and so we started doing these other things we started leaning harder on synths we started just generally making it a little younger a little more contemporary than than where we are in the boys because the boys is a pretty like brit punk garage rock sort of thing mm -hmm. um it's kind of meant to emulate our the spirit of the boys, which are, if you don't know the show, uh, a super quick synopsis is the boys are actually this group of people that have, do not have superpowers and they're trying to expose and take down a group of people that do have superpowers. So if you can imagine people without superpowers trying to do that, it's a gritty uh, kind of MacGyvery, just use what you have. Um, and so that's kind of how we approach the score. So coming up with the sound for gen v was we we wanted to because gen v takes place in a in a in the call in the university of the superhero world um we wanted to skew a little more contemporary but we not we didn't want to be like on the nose we didn't want it to sound like oh they're doing like a euphoria thing or, or mm -hmm. you know we weren't trying to be on the nose younger but just skew younger and so uh, you know, like electric bass is very prominent in the boys. It's like, well, what if we just don't use electric bass at all instead use synth bass and 808s? Um, but we can still, and now this is when we're going to get geeky, which... <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> uh, I, um, but we can still have a boys sensibility to it. So it's if we do use an 808, it's not like a clean, uh, it's not like a clean one that you, you know, might hear in a pop song. Um, you know, even then we're we're sending it through guitar pedals and we're distorting it, um, mm -hmm. or we might like have a hidden hidden eight oh eight, but then and then just use delay and then like let the delay be our pulse. And so it doesn't really sound like an eight oh eight, but the sound source was an eight oh eight, and that alone just feels different than if the sound source were an electric guitar. Yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of like subtle decisions like that um it, and i do think when we when we did our first round i say we because i co-scored it with chris leonard's when we did our first round of sketches um we push things too far too far mm -hmm. away from the boys um we didn't know that at the time but um i think that that was our goal and then it's easier it's easier to have somebody say hey rain it in you know Rather than, oh, if you could push it further, that's always harder. And if you're writing something and it's like, it kind of gets, it, you know, the, the last note you want to get is like, I kind of want more. It's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I want less. It's like, okay, let's, let's yeah. scale that back. So, um, so what things did you keep from the boys? 
Um, what we kept from the boys was a lot of the distortion and okay. the effects that we would use. So okay. um, the warping that you mentioned was something mm -hmm. we absolutely kept. Um, anything, we, we kind of treated our orchestra the exact same. So oh, really? that was that was a common thread. It's not a very or orchestra. Neither score is very orchestra heavy. I would say right. Right. it's in there, but it's not orchestra heavy. Um, and so, but that was kind of a nice crossover. Like we're we're going to do that the exact same way. We recorded our orchestra for the boys in Nashville. We recorded our orchestra for Gen V in Nashville. Which is like mm. let's do do all that the exact same. And then I thought of orchestra because one of our favorite things to do is to take the orchestra, we get it back, and then we we pitch bend it and warp it and 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 mangle it, which is um, just really funny to have, you know, <laughs> take all the time and energy and money, of course, to to have <laughs> this wonderfully recorded orchestra and then bring it back and then just mangle it. But that's <laughs> the, that's the um, that's that's the sound. So that was a direct crossover. Um, but that warping that you mentioned, which is, you know, as uh, a lot of it just has to do with kind of slow, this slow kind of unsettling pitch bend down, um, that and feedback, um, whether we're doing it uh, outside of the box or a lot of times we're, we're actually doing it inside the box, we're just kind of looping it until it starts to feedback on itself. Mm -hmm. um, we can use those two processes on new instruments but the fact that we're using those same processes uh, kind of makes it feel connected. So it's similar yeah. to what I was saying with the 808. Like the sound source is different. The sound source may be coming from a synth or maybe coming from a clean kind of chimey electric guitar, which we would never use on the boys because it's, it's always kind of punky and dirty and rolled off. So the sound source might be different, but the process is the same. Or if the sound source is the same then we were trying to make the process different is actually that's another thing we kind of generally try to do so for instance the sound source is the same the electric guitar well let's clean it up a little bit let's make it a little chimier um not like bright and poppy but still not something you'd ever hear on the boys mm -hmm. so with all this kind of experimentation especially warping the pre-recorded orchestra i know you have to have your cues approved first. How did you sell this idea to, you know, the music coordinator or the showrunners? Like what did you like make a mock up of this or how did you do it? How did you say this is going to be a great idea? <laughs> trust us. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, the day of trust us is long, long since gone. Um, even if, yeah. So to answer your question, yes, we, we did make a mock up uh, with, you know, a, a, sample with orchestra samples um, oh, okay and so yeah and, and that that really does get it 95 percent of the way there so it's not um the showrunner and producers they, they don't have to use their imagination at all it's like okay oh, okay this is how it's going to sound it'll just sound even better because it'll be live um but outside of the orchestra everything that they're hearing on our uh, on our sketches or mock-ups whatever you want to call them are are, are final okay. um, so and, and like i said it's not a it's not a hugely orchestral heavy score even if it's even if there is orchestra there's there's a lot you know there's like a choppy guitar going on and stuff mm -hmm. um so it it'll be pretty close to the finished version when they when they approve it but yeah okay. the, it, yeah there's there's no there's no like hey we're thinking about this and if you could <laughs> sign off on this huge expense boot and then that, that uh, and trust us that would be great <laughs> yeah i could see that kind of making them pause a little bit if they couldn't hear it before <laughs> yeah <laughs> beforehand and now you've worked as an orchestrator too i'm sure that helps with um when you're working with these synths and layering and finding textures and things like that how have you kind of used your experience in that sense in when you're working with um yeah, I guess more artificial and synthesized piece, pieces yeah. of uh, music. Yeah, great, great question. It, it's really all part of the Jedi training. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it, there really is as a, a composer needs to be able to do so much all at once. And there, there's so many different skill sets that you kind of need to learn. So I yeah. was incredibly thankful for the path that I just stumbled on. It was not my plan. 
But I've already mentioned the, you know, I, I work as an engineer first. And then the, the next step is, as you know, you as you might be able to work on somebody's team, the first step is to work as an orchestrator. Actually, the very first thing I ever did um, was uh, just as a per, as a producer on the score. Um, Chris would send me tracks and just say, "Hey, can you give this track some ear candy?" And which is so cool because the track is done. The track is just like, like he could have turned it in, right? Uh-huh. And they would have been like, "Cool, that's that's uh, that's a track." But he, uh, but he, you know, some of that those those production elements they take so much TLC. Um, and he, and I had worked with him enough where he trusted me. I think we do, uh, we work so well together as we share very similar production sensibilities. So yeah, that, that was my first foray and maybe that, that credit is as an arranger. Um, but then another, uh, I have arranged in an orchestral sense as well, mm-hmm. um, where you're sent like a very, you're, you're sent a cue that's kind of minimally laid out and it's your job to kind of flush it out and then to flush it out yeah yeah and then my my version not my version but my i, I guess the version coming off literally off my computer is what's sent for approval gotcha so mm-hmm. um it's like here here's my orchestration and here's how it sounds great we'll send that and then that gets approved and then I send all of my MIDI and whatever to the orchestrators. Um, mm-hmm. And then that's when it goes off into that, that process um, where every, wow. they, you know, everything that I, everything that I did ends up getting replaced, which is fine. It's all <laughs> part of the job. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I worked really people? hard to make those strings sound realistic and now they're just gone. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it happens. It happens. How many yeah. people are on your team? Um, well, let's see. On like on the Gen V team, mm-hmm. or yeah. um, well, we we have a couple of additional writers. We have two assistants that do anything and everything. We have an orchestrator. Uh, we have a mixer. Um, uh, who am I forgetting? Well, we of course have a music editor. Um, um, I forget that uh, he's obviously immensely on our team. I always forget to mention that though, because that, that budget comes from production. That's not part of right. like the, the music, uh, score budget, but, um, in, uh, incredibly important team member, of course, the music editor, um, mm-hmm. boy, that's a, uh, I could go down a music editor rabbit hole. Like you, uh, <laughs> as I've as I've worked on more and more prominent shows, then the role of music editor becomes more and more prominent, and it's so luxurious. Like problems just go away. They they don't. <laughs> if he can fix it, it doesn't ever even show up on my desk, and it's it's like, oh, this this picture that you thought was locked is no longer locked, and it affects this scene. And then and he'll just send an email. It's like, don't worry about it. And like, I won't even ask, like, I won't ask the follow-up questions. If I'm told yeah. to not worry about it, I'm going to not worry about it. <laughs> and he just makes it sound like it was meant just, to be that yeah, way. He makes it sound, uh, I can't even hear the edit. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. If you yeah. can't even hear the edit, that's no. really impressive. Wow. No, he's, he's, uh, he's, yeah. His name is Chris Brooks. If you want to look up his IMDB, he has, uh, well, let's just say he was a music, uh, editor on, on Die Hard. So he's been around for, yeah. um, he, he, he knows his level of black magic is high. <laughs> That's great. So, um, so you have this team that you're all working with as the co-composer. Do you ever find yourself like, I don't know, thinking, oh, I could, do that better or like do you have a hard time passing things off to people being a team player or is that something that you're actually pretty good at oh boy it's gonna become a therapy session um <laughs> i uh, didn't realize you don't have no, to answer <laughs> no 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 I'm just, it, it's something that i um uh, i really really enjoy running the team i really enjoy it um i enjoy working uh, with them, I enjoy the collaborative process and the collaborative feel. It's, it's just really nice to get out of your own head. Um, absolutely, you run into like, well, that's not how I would have done it. <clears throat> Excuse me, mm-hmm. uh, but that's it's not like a better or a worse thing. It's just a, they're not me and I'm not them. So of course, we're not going to do it the same way. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's 
for the better. It's like, wow, that's a fresh thing that I would have never come up with. Mm -hmm. And now the score is better for it. And sometimes it's like, oh, we, we can't, we can't do that. I would, I would love, I'd like to think they agree that they all have the freedom to, to push, to push things. Um, so I, I do really enjoy it. I, the line between would I have done that or not is, is a, is still one that I'm working on. I, I haven't been on the team managing side for very long. Chris mm -hmm. has been on the team managing side for, I don't know, 20 years. Um, so he, you know, uh, it's very nice to work with him because we'll, we'll both review the team's work and, Sometimes I'll be like, ah, oh, this, 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 this. And he'll be like, yeah, I agree with Matt. I agree with Matt. That's, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, uh, like, no, that's, it, it's fine. Um, so it's nice that I can, it, it's really nice co scoring with him because I can check in with his perspective. He's often able to zoom out better than I am, mm -hmm. um, where I get a little hyper focused on this. It's like, well, is that actually going to, affect the scene is what it really comes down to is that going yeah. to affect the scene and if not then just don't touch it yeah oh my goodness i love talking to you i love hearing your story about how you came and you asked questions and now you're the one answering questions and you're <laughs> directing this team i love i love it i think it's a fantastic story um unfortunately we have to to finish up here so the last question that i have for you is what advice would you give to aspiring musicians or aspiring composers, what would you tell them is like the most important thing that they need to know? Oh boy, what do they need to know? Um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of luck. I'm not mm -hmm. going to overlook um, the amount of luck I've had. Um, and then from an advice standpoint, it's really to just um, get as many experiences as you can like as varied experiences as you can, you know, it's the, the, like I, I, my first instrument after violin was guitar. And so I was like learning how to like chunk out chords. And by that time I had started that internship and I saw somebody like using an Ebo, which is, you, you know, uh, or like just using the guitar in ways that are not traditional and be like, that's, that's not how you are supposed to use it. Oh, it, there's no there's no rules to anything you know there's no rules to, to to if all you have for a score is a piano you can pick it apart and you can pluck the bass notes and you can you know uh i'm sorry i'm going long-winded here but um just, i guess just you know if all you've ever done is classical and a friend's like hey do you want to come and jam with my with my jazz group rather than saying i don't know what a, how to do jazz so no thank you you can say i don't know how to do jazz but i would love to join um, um and and not that that's you know necessarily a path for you to go down but just even just being exposed to it will make you a better musician yeah. overall yeah oh that's great advice i love it and i love it and i can see how your curiosity has served you so well in your in your career and how you're just always wanting to learn and it's done so well and you're making this amazing music i love it so, oh, thank um, you. Yeah. So, Matt Bowen, thank you so much for being here. It has been such a pleasure to chat with you, and I just appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah.